Good morning, beloved BUC. My name is Bridget Bechtel. I use the pronouns she and her, and I serve this congregation as a sabbatical minister. Welcome to our online service this morning as we wait patiently for power to be restored on our campus. If you feel comfortable doing so, you may show your video so that we can wave hello to one another. Let's do that. It will also be helpful this morning if you uh, put your view settings on your Zoom on speaker view. And that way you can see uh, those who are speaking in the big frame. And also, since this is the Sunday in which we normally light memorial candles, if you have a candle available, it might be uh, good for you to have it available and light it during that part of today's service, if you wish. And now let us join in our call to worship. We are a justice-making, truth-seeking people. We gather as a community of believers and seekers. We share a reverence for the mystery of life. We are building the beloved community. Come, let us worship together. This morning's prelude is a piece by African-American composer Betty Jackson King. I hope you enjoy this piece called Winter Holiday. Good morning, Birmingham Unitarian Church. 
it is good to be together again, especially on this day where we should be feeling powerless, but we all have Zoom to feel with together. So whether you are joining us today on Zoom or watching this recording later, it is good to connect with you. Sorry, part of my script is... <clears throat> Uh, as a multi-platform church, it is important that we build a bridge between our online and what would normally be in-person participants. So let's take all a moment and greet each other again. Flip on your camera, look through the gallery view, because remember, wherever and however we connect, with BUC. We are building BUC at home, on campus, in the world, every day. We are Birmingham Unitarian Church, and we are building a beloved community. Well, our first hymn this morning is going to be There is More Love Somewhere. And we know that there is a lot of love in this space, even if we're not able to be physically together. So Myra will play this beautiful hymn and we'll do three verses. There's more love, there's more hope, and there's more joy. Let's all sing out fully in our homes. Let us light our chalice while Derek will say the words. We join with other Unitarian Universalists around the world as we light our chalice. In times of tumult and loss, reminders of our strengths of adaptivity and camaraderie are found in these words from Robert Rohr. All great spirituality is about what we do with our pain. By trying to handle all suffering through willpower, denial, medication, or even therapy, we have forgotten something that should be obvious. We do not handle suffering. Suffering handles us in deep and mysterious ways that ironically, become the very matrix of life. Suffering, and sometimes awe, has the most power to lead us into genuinely new 
experiences. Our theme for today is practicing patience. States of mind like mindfulness, awakening or enlightenment do not happen just because we want to achieve them. Sometimes they come to a person in a flash of insight or to others they do not come at all. Usually they occur after a long time of practice. There is no such thing as practicing enlightenment. Rather, the actual practice may be focused on sitting in meditation, doing reflective readings, and participating in rituals. After doing this patiently for a long period of time, awakening or enlightenment may happen. In many religious traditions, what is practiced patiently inside the sanctuary may lead to important life outcomes in a larger dimension. Our soul may grow, so we may become a kinder people. In the civil rights movement, education has been pursued by great leaders with short-term obje objectives and the longer aspirational goal of freedom and full and equal participation in building the beloved community. Working towards this long range goal required many things, including patience. We will recall today how Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois were both passionately committed to education, but with different short term goals and methods. Our Time for All Ages this morning is uh, a book called Education is Power, a Snippet in the Life of W.E.B. Du Bois. And this is by Lenny Williams. And uh, I wanted to read, uh, it's actually at the end of the book, a little bit uh, about W.E.B. Du Bois before we begin. So the story I'm about to read is about African-American civil rights activist W.E.B. Du Bois who was actually born just a few days ago on uh, February 23rd in 1868. This story teaches children about the need for education. Young W.E.B. Du Bois will be talking about how education gave him the power to become a great learner and a great teacher. This power found through education led him to become a leader, an author, a humanitarian and activist and an overall great person that made an impact on history. Education is power and it gives us a better understanding of the world around us. I'm pretty sure your parents and teachers have told you about the amazing things that an education can do for you too. It gave me the ability to be a great leader and a great teacher, which are qualities a person needs to be a great leader. Hi, my name is W.E.B. Du Bois, and I wanna tell you how education changed my life. Here's how it all happened. Early on in school, my teacher saw how excited I was about learning. She knew that learning new things was very special to me because I enjoyed studying and earning A's on my tests. One day, she told me if I study really hard, not only would my education give me an honor role, but it would also give me the ability to do whatever I wanted in life. Not only is education power, but education gives power to those who, to anyone who desires it. I lived by those words of the adults in my life and powered my way straight to college. Actually, I loved learning so much that I went to three different colleges. First, I went to Fisk University and then I attended the University of Berlin. 
Fun fact, did you know that the University of Berlin is in Germany? Education can take you all around the world. I went on to become the first African-American to earn a doctorate degree from Harvard, oops. oh no, from Harvard University. So feel free to call me Dr. Du Bois if you like. Learning and becoming a great leader was important, but it was also fun. I wanted to share the power of education with my friends so they could join in on the fun too. So I created a group known as the Talented Tenth, and I helped start the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Creating those groups helped my friends and even complete strangers get an education. As a group of young leaders, we taught them history, math, reading, writing, and science. I did not stop there either. I continued to share education everywhere I went. I taught a class at Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia. Then I visited the wonderful country of Ghana in West Africa. I also taught while I was in Ghana, but my favorite part about being in a country far away from home was learning many outstanding things about the many cultures and ways of living that were different from what I was familiar with in America. No matter where I traveled, one thing remained the same. Education was always needed. Using your brain power to learn gives you the ability to be whoever you want to be, do whatever you want to do, and go wherever you want to go. You have the power to be an astronaut, a doctor, a teacher, or even the owner of your favorite sports team. Anything is possible and there is no limit. And I believe, oh, one last page. Try learning something new every day and you'll see, education is power. And then, in case you were wondering, this is a picture of W.E.B. Du Bois. And now we would like to open up for a, our request for offering. Uh, the, Birming, the mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity in learning, service, and joy. One way we live this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas, environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. Our recipient for February is the Michigan UU Social Justice Network, also known as Moose Gin. This is a statewide coalition of UU congregations and our allies working together for progressive change. BUC is a member of this network, which leverages resources and expertise to support the members' congregation's social justice work. It also joins with the allies to expand the coalition's impact. Our donations from this plate enable Moose Gin to engage consultants to assist with this work. If you wish to make an offering this morning in support of our beloved community and organizations that build the world we dream about, you may do so online by going to the church's webpage at bucmi.org, click the giving tab, and follow the directions there. This morning, as we contemplate gratitude, I will be sharing On Bended Knee by Harry T. Burley, another African-American composer. I hope you enjoy.
we dedicate our offering to the ministries of this beloved community. And now, let us enter a time of reflection, prayer, and remembrance. We begin this part with looking over the joys and sorrows that have been submitted uh, for this day. And there are several joys that the, com that the congregation wants to share. First, the congregation shares a joy with Stephen, who announces that the music program is pleased to share that it received a generous gift from the estate of Janet Patterson. Janet was one of the original members of the BUC choir and participated as a singer up till a few years ago. The congregation shares a joy with Brian Laferriere, who announces a joy. He says, I am leaving for London tomorrow for two weeks of ocean sailing crew racing training. It is in preparation for sailing 33 days from London to South America this September. <laughs> and the congregation also shares a joy with Catherine Connolly, who writes, joy to the spirit of the Ukrainian people who have endured the ravages of war with the invasion of Russian troops for a year on February 24th. The hardships are innumerable and the cruelty incalculable. This point is a reminder that our community experiences a cycle of both joys and sorrows. This morning, a congregation shares a sorrow with Carol Wiseman, who writes that longtime BUC member Roger Marshall has entered hospice care at the home of his daughter, Jennifer, and husband, Mark Evans. Those interested in sending notes to Roger may contact Carol Wiseman. Her name is in the member directory. And let us hold a few moments of silence for all the joys and the sorrows that are not spoken or submitted here today, but that are held in our hearts. On the fourth Sunday of every month, we light candles to remember those who have died in that month in any year. If you have a candle available, you may light it for anyone you are remembering this day or for a concern that weighs on your heart. For those who do not have a candle, the candle illuminating the chalice also represents those who are remembered here today. As you light your candle or contemplate the chalice, you are invited to say the name of whom you remember or any concern that you have. Let us dedicate some moments to these remembrances.
As we memorialize our loved ones in our hearts, please join in singing three verses of Comfort Me. Comfort me, sing with me, and speak for me. Spirit of life, spirit of love, create a force of many names. Be with us on this fourth Sunday as we remember those who have died in the month of February. May we feel up your presence in our continuing sorrows related to tragedies that have happened around us the murders of students on the MSU campus, the environmental disaster in Ohio, the devastating loss of life in the earthquake in Turkey and Syria, and the continuing atrocities taking place in the Ukraine. May we extend sympathy, empathy, and compassion to all, our close family and community, our congregation, and those farther away, regardless of geography, ethnicity, religion, gender, or other distinctions. May we practice our compassion with patience. And may we be able to extend loving kindness to ourselves and to all living beings today and always. This is our prayer. Amen and blesses be. Born in 1914, Dudley Randall lived in Detroit since age nine and published poems in the Detroit Free Press when he was 13. 
He worked in Ford's River Rouge Foundry for five years, served in the South Pacific during World War II, and then graduated from Wayne State and the University of Michigan. He was the founder of Broadside Press and was Detroit's first poet laureate. Before his death in 2000, he was described as the Detroit, in the Detroit Magazine as arguably the strongest influence in Black poetry movement in the last 15 years. This is his poem, Booker T and W.E.B. published in 1969. It seems to me, said Booker T, it shows a mighty lot of cheek to study chemistry and Greek when Mr. Char Charlie needs a hand to hoe the cotton on his land. And when Miss Anne looks for a cook, why stick your nose inside a book? I don't agree, said W.E.B. If I should have the drive to seek knowledge of chemistry or Greek, I'll do it. Charles and Miss can look another place for hand or cook. Some men rejoice in skill of hand and some in cultivating land, but there are others who maintain the right to cultivate the brain. It seems to me, said Booker T, that all you folks have missed the boat who shout about the right to vote and spend vain days and sleepless nights in uproar over civil rights. Just keep your mouth shut, do not grouse, but work and save and buy a house. I don't agree, said W.E.B., for what can property avail if dignity and justice fail? Unless you help to make the laws, they'll steal your house with trumped up claws. A rope's as tight, a fire is hot, no matter how much cash you've got. Speak soft and try your little plan, but as for me, I'll be a man. It seems to me, said Booker T, I don't agree, said W.E.B. Today's sermon has the title, Time for Patience. Ah, uh, patience. According to the dictionary, patience is the capacity or the habit to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, disappointment, or suffering without getting angry, frustrated, or anxious. For most of us, that is not an easy thing to do. We have a tendency to justify our lack of patience with the perceived lack of time. I started to think about all the ways I see time as if it were a major cause of my stress or even an enemy. I frequently catch myself saying that I'm running out of time. I have no time to do that. You're wasting my time. Time is slipping away. Use time wisely. I lost so much time. I'm on the clock and so on. Great thinkers, of course, have weighed in on this also. In his book, Nausea, the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre wrote about clock time and our daily time rhythm related to it. Three o'clock. Three o'clock is always too late or too early for anything you want to do. An odd moment in the afternoon, he said. That moment seemed wasted to him because he focused on what he wanted to get accomplished. Indeed, all these thoughts related to time somehow seem to be related to starting points and end points in a project or a plan. A poem by the 13th century Zen master Dogen shows an understanding of time that is very different. He wrote this, do not ask me where I am going. As I travel in the limitless world, 
where every step I take is my home. No moment is a wasted moment. The only time truly lost is the moment when we do not live with intention. <clears throat> After I watched the movie, The Karate Kid, when it first came out in the 1980s, I became aware that the training of the teenager who aspired to defend himself against some bullies and to compete in a karate tournament against them took the form of a process. The end point in his mind of that process, the aspirational goal the teenager had, was not even mentioned by the teacher. Many of us remember how the teacher, Mr. Miyagi, taught the teenager to apply wax to the floor and then to remove it. There were those famous lines, wax on and wax off. And let's do this together. We wax on with our right hand and we wax off with our left hand like this. So let's practice, wax on, wax off. As it turns out, the endless practicing of wax on and wax off was useful. The wax off was getting the karate kid ready to automatically make a defensive move. And the wax on was really the offensive move. Regardless, the karate kid eventually prevailed against the bullies and won the tournament. And at first, Mr. Miyagi had to tell him wax on or wax off. And he knew what the training meant. This story is similar to the historical account, a true account brought back from Japan by a German scholar. He was an anthropologist and a philosopher. And it was a story of how an archer was able to aim and hit a bullseye of a target in the dark twice in a row. The training focused on the right posture at every moment of taking aim without need to even see the target. Just like the archer, the karate kid had to accept that he needed to focus on what the teacher told him rather than on his preconceived ideas that ran along the lines of, just quickly show me how I can get the best of those bullies and win the tournament. Instead, he had to learn the mindset called show shin or beginner's mind. There is a story about beginner's mind that goes like this. A well-known Zen teacher named Nan In received a visitor who was a professor and who wanted to learn about the Zen practice. Now, professors can be people who think they know a lot and they often want to show that off. So when the teacher served tea to his visitor, the visitor was indeed eagerly chatting away, showing off his knowledge that he already had about Zen, instead of paying attention to the teacher. Nan In poured the cup full. He poured and poured and kept pouring. The professor watched the tea flowing over the rim of the cup and finally couldn't take it anymore and burst out. Stop it already, the cup is over full. You can't pour in any more. Indeed, said Nan In. Just like this teacup, you are over full of yourself. No more will go in. How can I teach you unless you first empty your cup? A beginner's mind is important both for the karate kid and for the student of Nan In because learning also requires unlearning and relearning. We need to free ourselves from being fixed in the way we think. This is also important when we engage on a path of intentional spirituality. And it can be an important approach to anything we do, from simple everyday tasks to great undertakings that take place over a long period of time. And during Black History Month, of course, the great undertaking to reflect on is the civil rights movement, 
and the role that many individuals played in it. Today's focus is on two of these great individuals, Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Of the two, Booker T., who was older, had been born a slave on a farm in the state of Virginia in 1856. He lived in a tiny shack that had no windows, just holes in the wall, where the cold wind would blow in during the winter. Some of the facts that I'm telling you about uh, Booker T. Washington come from a little book by uh, James Dudley Jr. So Booker T. had no last name. His name Washington he took on at a later time. But he was listed as Booker and as a $400 piece of property in the ledger of the Burroughs farm. Enslaved children were prohibited from going to school, but when Booker walked by the schoolhouse for the white children as he went to do his chores, he dreamed of learning. When the Emancipation Proclamation was read by a Union Army officer at the Burroughs Farm, Booker's mother moved with her sons to West Virginia to join her husband, and the boys started working in a coal mine and also in a salt factory. Booker squeezed in time to go to the schoolhouse and then later on to the Hampton Institute in Richmond, Virginia, where he eventually also became a teacher. His reputation grew and grew. And when the state of Alabama created a new school in 1881, designed to educate black people to become teachers, they eventually appointed Booker T. Washington to lead it. When he arrived, it was just an empty lot called the Tuskegee, the Tuskegee Normal School. The school was literally built from the ground up by the students and the teachers. With dedication, time, and a lot of patience, they even made the bricks out of dust. But after a bit more than a decade, the Tuskegee School had over a dozen buildings and more than 1,000 students becoming one of the largest schools in the Southern region. And Booker T. Washington was famous. And this is when a defining moment happened. In 1895, he was invited to speak at a large exposition held by white business people and farmers in Atlanta. There, he formulated the idea that the best way forward for Black Americans was to do it gradually. He called for patience, work with the hands, take paying jobs as agricultural workers, mechanics, and domestic workers. So he was saying that Blacks and whites should be separate in the jobs they do, like segregation. The Southern whites loved the idea. But Booker T had something else in mind under the surface that he's not always credited for. Intellectuals like W.E.B. Du Bois were adamantly opposed to his formulated plan. And we heard an extreme version of that in the poem that was read by Shannon today. For W.E.B. Du Bois, this path was too slow. Black people should study Greek and geometry and compete on an equal, even playing field with whites, he said. But quietly and without using his own name, Booker T. Washington helped Black citizens to bring many court cases to obtain their legal rights. And that has become one of the strategies in the civil rights movement. At the same time, he continued to work for the advancement of the Tuskegee Institute. And he became the first African-American to get an honorary degree from Harvard University. 
Who was white? W.E.B. Du Bois's way was like the use of the white hand by the karate kid. Go on the offensive, wax on, keep waxing on. Booker T. Washington's approach was similar to the use of the left hand by the karate kid. Be defensive, be careful, be patient, be ready. Likely, both the wax on and the wax off were valid strategies in the struggle for civil rights, together with other approaches like direct action. In the time when Jim Crow laws were being passed, like Plessy versus Ferguson, which also passed in the late 1800s, which essentially sanctioned separate but equal, Booker T played the more defensive strategy that allowed him to work silently behind the scenes via the court system and essentially was unopposed in his own educational endeavors. He kept working with teachers, with dedication and patience. So Booker T kept using that left hand defensive wax off approach very effectively. At the Tuskegee Institute, you may have heard uh, about the Tuskegee Airmen. All of them were graduates of the Tuskegee Institute. So we can say that both Booker T's and W.E.B. Du Bois's approaches were valid. They were like both and, as we say. May we also be inspired to apply patience in choices that will bring benefits in the long run. May we use wise combinations of waxing on and waxing off. May we make it so. And now let's join in singing every time I feel the spirit. And when we feel the spirit, maybe it's the spirit to vote. Maybe it's the spirit to protest. Maybe it's the patience and the spirit to fight against injustice. But every time we feel the spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. We'll do just that refrain three times. Sing out fully from your hearts. Go now into this world as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. May it be so. Amen and blessed be.